and welcome to the 2011 Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Lecture, the university's 25th annual observance of the King holiday. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to the campus former Georgia State Director of Rural Development and Civil Rights Activist, this year's memorial lecturer, Ms. Shirley Sherrard. and her husband, Charles. Earlier this morning, um, Charles shared with us that his name used to be Charles Sherrard, but these days, uh, he's Shirley Sherrard's husband. <laughs> <laughs> I want to recognize the regents of the university who are with us this morning, Regent Kathy White of Ann Arbor, and her parents, Bob and Sandy. and Regent Julia Darlow, uh, Chair of the Board of Regents from Ann Arbor. We're pleased to have students from area schools, people from the greater Ann Arbor community, and students, faculty, and staff from around the campus join us this morning for this very special occasion. And I should point out that we have over 800 students meeting uh, in another part of campus that um, Professor Henry Mears brought to the campus, and those numbers are about at that level every year. We'll, we also have students from the greater Chicago area with us today. So please welcome them. And please join me in welcoming Director Adele Anderson and the audience gathered at the Detroit Center who join us via video telecast. I want to invite our Detroit audience to be with us again for other simulcasts of MLK activities held here on the Ann Arbor campus. And thank all of you for gathering at the Detroit Center. This year's symposium theme, We the People Realizing the Dream, takes me back to my fifth grade class in the segregated schools of Little Rock, Arkansas. As part of our morning devotional service, we recited the preamble to the Constitution, along with the Pledge of Allegiance, the Lord's Prayer, and the 23rd Psalm. So much for prayer in schools. At 10 years old, we knew very little about the real history of the Constitution. But even at such a young age and living in a segregated society, we knew that our ancestors were slaves, that the creators of the original Constitution considered people of African descent three-fifths of a human being, and that we, the people, did not always re refer to the African-American community. As a youngster, I often overheard the adults of that era express a high degree of hopelessness and despair about the many injustices of the day. But Dr. King never lost faith in the democratic principles set forth in the Constitution and its subsequent amendments that mended many of the flaws of that original document. Even after he was found guilty of trumped up charges and fined in a Montgomery court for leading a bus boycott in 1956, he urged his fellow protesters to keep the faith in the democratic system. He said, let us not lose faith in democracy, for with all of its weaknesses, there is a ground and a basis of hope in our democratic creed. Along these same lines, we should hear his words from his famous 1963 I Have a Dream speech, in which he called for racial equality and the end of discrimination, and he said, in a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unenable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So as we move through this celebration and commemoration of Martha, uh, Martin Luther King's legacy, let us not forget his words and his wisdom. 
I want to offer um, thanks, special thanks to those individuals and groups on the campus who have worked to make this year's commemoration a success. First to Provost Phil Hanlon for hosting this morning's breakfast for our guests. Phil, will you please stand? And none of this uh, could have happened or taken place without the work carried out by Associate Vice Provost and Director of the Office of Ac Academic Multicultural Initiatives, Dr. John Matlock. John, where are you? <laughs> Along with the co-coordinators of the Symposium Planning Committee, uh, Ms. Theda Gibbs and Dr. Loomis Erlier. Will you two please stand? Where are you? And of course, we need to thank the Martin Luther King Planning Committee. Would you all please stand? Thank you all for your good work. I also want to express our appreciation to Tom Bray from the Digital Media Commons for his assistance with the telecast to the Detroit Center, uh, Gwen Tandy uh, from uh, Conference Services, and um, where is Gwen? Gwen, can you step out just a minute because this is her very last MLK Day um, conference because uh, she will be retiring. Gwen, can you hear me? Can you please step, step out and be recognized? I guess she's not listening backstage. And I would also like to thank our American Sign Language Specialist, uh, Deborah uh, Froreep and Gina Halliburton. And to all of our campus and community groups who work to organize the many programs and activities that are spread over the next four weeks, making the University of Michigan's celebration and commemoration of the Martin Luther King Day um, holiday the largest on any campus in the United States. <laughs> Something we should be very proud of. It is now my pleasure to introduce the 13th president of the University of Michigan and the person leading the charge for diversity on our campus in the state of Michigan and in the nation, Dr. Mary Sue Coleman. Good morning. Please join me in thanking Dr. Montz and his staff, as well as the Office of Academic Multicultural Initiatives and the Martin Luther King Jr. Committee for planning this symposium. They are responsible for organizing a series of wonderful events, including bringing us this morning's keynote speaker, Shirley Sherrod. I want to share a conversation I recently had with one of our students. Every month, I hold a fireside chat, and shortly before the holiday break, I met with a group of students who, as always, had lots of interesting questions and opinions. Matt Griffith was one of those students. He is a member of the Men's Glee Club, a member of its executive board, in fact, and he asked me about being a leader and working to build diversity. Matt is African American, and he would like to see the Glee Club have a more diverse membership. And so we talked about U of M and this university's willingness to take risks with its continual pursuit of an open, welcoming campus. I hope Matt is here today because I want everyone to hear how proud I am of him and his commitment. Our university is known nationally for holding open its doors to people of all backgrounds and cultures, and he is continuing this important legacy. It is the very reason I was attracted to Michigan more than eight years ago, and it is the very reason we pause each year to celebrate the work and life of Dr. Martin Luther King. 
Building diversity is the work of many people. We the people. We the people. It's the theme of this year's symposium, and it is the essence of our university. Because an inclusive culture is our greatest strength as a community. Because we the people make the University of Michigan a place unlike any other. We the people made the pledge 40 years ago that gay students, faculty, and staff at Michigan would be welcomed and supported. We were the first university in the country to create an office to serve lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender students. And this year, we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Spectrum Center. As part of that celebration, we will be proud to host the largest student-led LGBT conference in the nation next month. Yes. We, the people, we the people of Michigan, made a commitment in 1971 to better serve students of color. It was a fractious time on campus and in our country, but we held firm to our word. Today, that pledge takes the form of the William Monroe Trotter Cultural Center and the Office of Multi-Ethnic Student Affairs, two campus institutions that serve students of color and promote diversity at Michigan. This year, we are pleased to celebrate their 40th anniversary. And today, as a university community, we are marking the 25th year of celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. King. Yes. The University of Michigan continues to explore the powerful actions of Reverend King and those of others with this symposium and its hundreds of lectures, films, performances, and group discussions. Listen to Dr. King's words. Human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle the tireless exertions and passionate concerns of dedicated individuals. He is talking about us, our community, we the people. We must remain vigilant. We must remain a community of people who step forward to make a difference, like Matt Griffith with the Glee Club. All must be heard from the music of a glee club to the concerns of gay students and the voices of students of color. Diversity and openness will always be Michigan values, and we will continually challenge ourselves to do more and to do better. This is the fabric of Michigan. As I told Matt when we talked about determination, the university is never going to say, well, let's take that off our list. Our gains are important, and they are necessary. Creating and supporting a diverse campus strengthens our academic excellence, and academic excellence will always be the backbone of the University of Michigan. We, the people, will make certain of that. Thank you. And now, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Cole, Professor of Psychology in Afro and African American Studies and Chair of the Department of Women's Studies, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Elizabeth. Thank you, President Coleman. It is my privilege today to introduce Shirley Sherrod. Many of us first learned Sherrod's name last summer when a conservative blogger posted video excerpts on his website of an address Sherrod made at an NAACP event. At the time, Sherrod worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture as Georgia State's Director of Rural Development, 
She was the first African-American person to hold that position. According to the blogger, her comments showed how a federally appointed executive racially discriminated against a white farmer. The video set off a storm of controversy and public criticism of Sherrod, and she was forced to resign from her position. Later, it came to light that the clip had been taken out of context, and that Sherrod's address conveyed a completely different meaning, that she had initially felt the white farmer assumed a superior attitude toward her because of his race, but in the address she talked about how through her experience working on his case, she came to realize that poverty and not race was the key factor in rural development. President Obama and the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Agriculture apologized for having criticized her, and the USDA later offered her another job, which she declined. This story has so much to teach us today as we gather to observe the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. I'm proud that at Michigan, we've had a long tradition that the King holiday is not just a day off, but a day of reflection and learning. And in fact, students started this practice as a teach-in 25 years ago. As a faculty member in women's studies and African American studies, I often teach about the ideas of diversity and social justice that Dr. King worked for and has come to represent. In my courses, I regularly challenge students to engage in difficult dialogues about issues of race, gender, sexuality, and inequality. And like many faculty who teach this material, it's my hope that in the classroom, we can achieve a kind of dialogue that's often missing in our public conversations about race and other forms of diversity. I want my students to have conversations that facilitate their growth and learning, conversations that are thoughtful, meaningful, honest, and respectful. One way that I've tried to foster that kind of dialogue is by asking students on the very first day to think about a time that they've engaged in conversations about diversity that were frustrating, and also about a time that they had that kind of exchange and felt it was productive. What was it, I asked them, that made those conversations go the way they did? And there are a couple of ideas that seem to come up almost every time. My students talk about how important it is to be willing to reflect on our own views and to change them. And that was exactly the point of the personal story that Mrs. Sherrod shared at the NAACP banquet. And students talk about the importance of listening to others, really listening and trying to understand experiences that are different from their own before they speak themselves. And that's exactly what we didn't see much of in the media coverage of Sherrod's remarks in the media. But I also want to emphasize that Ms. Sherrod's biography reflects the bigger lessons that we hope our students will learn about diversity during their years at Michigan. Her story reflects a lifelong commitment to work for social justice and of the dedication and courage such work requires. All of this despite the race-related tragedy that she endured early in her life. Shirley Sherrod was born in Georgia in 1947. When she was 17, her father was shot to death by a white farmer over a dispute about livestock. No charges were returned against the shooter by the all-white grand jury. But this was a turning point in her life that led her to feel she should stay in the South to bring about change. While working on her bachelor's degree, she participated in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, in the struggle for civil rights. It was also during this time that she met her future husband, Minister Charles Sherrod. During the 60s, Sherrod and her husband developed innovative projects to provide African Americans with sustainable, affordable housing and opportunities to farm the land security, securely. One of these projects was a 6,000 acre collective farm in Lee County, Georgia. At the time, it was the largest tract of black owned land in the US. Sherrod went on to work with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives to help black farmers keep their land. And along the way, she earned a master's degree in community development from Antioch University through the Rural Development Leadership Network. This program allowed community activists in rural areas to continue their work for their local communities at the same time that they earned their degree. 
Sherrod later served on the board of the Rural Development Leadership Network before joining the USDA in 2009. Clearly, Mrs. Sherrod has had a long and successful career working tirelessly and creatively to represent the interests of small farmers. And the media events of last summer should be no more than a footnote to her distinguished record. Today, we are privileged to come together as a community in this beautiful auditorium to take part in the 25th observance of the King holiday. The planners of the symposium have asked us to consider the ways that despite the huge distance we as a nation have traveled since the Founding Fathers drafted the Declaration of Independence, persistent poverty, racial disparities, and intolerance indicate that we do not yet live out the true meaning of the creed of equality they expressed. And the planners invoke Dr. King's charge to each of us to be dissatisfied with this inequality. We're very fortunate then to have Mrs. Shirley Sherrod here with us today to deliver the 25th Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 2011 keynote memorial lecture. Her work is an example to us all of what we can accomplish if we refuse to be satisfied with injustice and inequality. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning to President Coleman, the faculty, students, and guests of this great university. It is such a pleasure for me to be with you today to celebrate the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King, and especially to be here for your 25th anniversary of the commemoration of his work. And to also be here with a theme, like the theme that you have, We the People, Reliving the Dream. You know, my work in the Civil Rights Movement started many, many years ago. I was grow I grew up in I grew up on the farm, and um, anyone who knows about that kind of work know that it's hard. And I attended the segregated school in Baker County, Georgia. And I should just tell you a little about Baker County to help you understand how it was a place I wanted to get as far away from as I could. You know, growing up on the farm picking cotton, I would talk to the son and say, you just wait until I get out of high school. <laughs> no, nothing else ever to do with agriculture. I definitely did not <laughs> want to have anything to do with it. And then being from Baker County, where there were two sheriffs, uh, one um, before I was born, and one during my lifetime. The first sheriff that I'll talk about, has an, his, what he did has an impact on us today. His name was Claude Screws, and he lynched a black person who was a member of our family, Bobby Hall, back in the early 40s. Now, why would I tell you about him now? Well, the interesting thing that happened back then, because even in 1965, in later years when my father was murdered, a white man could murder a black man in Baker County and know that nothing would ever happen to him. Well, same with the sheriff. But the interesting thing was that he was 
uh, tried and found guilty, not of murdering Bobby Hall, but of depriving Bobby Hall of his civil rights. He appealed the conviction all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, where it was overturned. And the justice who wrote the opinion said the appropriate charge was murder, but he was not charged with murder. He said in order to um, not find him guilty, you had to prove that as the sheriff was murdering Bobby Hall, he, in, he was thinking about depriving him of his civil rights. So the whole issue of proving intent, you heard it a lot when Rodney King was beaten in California. They kept talking about proving intent. It came from Screws versus the U.S. government. And Screws, of course, was the sheriff in Baker County. During my lifetime, the sheriff was L. Warren Gator Johnson. He wanted to be called Gator. They, and he ruled Baker County. No one, white or black, could ride through the county without being stopped. And, you know, I was talking when, when all of this unfolded, um, in the news media, and I was with the Spooners, and there, were, there was a local reporter uh, in, the, in the restaurant where we were. We were reminiscing about the old, I mean, about the old days, and this was a white reporter. And he said, you know, you couldn't ride through Baker County unless you had money, because you had to pay. You had to pay on the road. Now, if you were black, you had to have money, and you could be killed. So it was that kind of atmosphere, atmosphere, you know, living in a segregated county where the sheriff ruled. And it's so interesting that he could do what he did because you had, there was a, a major plantation there owned by a person who was, who was known throughout the, this country and other parts of the world because he was the chair of Coca-Cola, Robert Woodruff. He owned a 33,000-acre plantation there. And the Mellon family, a 25,000-acre plantation. And there were other plantations owned by the Olin family and others. And you would think that with people like that, it would have, the, the sheriff of Baker County uh, would not have been able, you know, these were people who lived in other parts of the country where they were more progressive. But um, I often wonder if they also benefited from being able to come to a place like Baker County. I know we could never get paved roads because Wood Woodruff didn't want paved roads. He wanted to come to the country and feel like he was in the country. <laughs> Those of us who lived in the country needed paved roads. <laughs> Um, but anyway, that, that's, that, that's what I grew up in and wanted to get as far away from it as I could. So I couldn't tell my father um, who, you know, I'm, I'm, I was the oldest at the, during his lifetime of five girls. Now, he was a farmer, and he wanted a son so bad, but they kept having girls. He wanted a son so bad that he gave all of us boys nicknames. I was Bill. <laughs> you know? So I couldn't share with my father. Now, he wanted us to have an education, but he wanted us to have an education and not live too far from home. So I couldn't share with him that I was dreaming of leaving Baker County to never live there again. It was my dream to be able to go and live in the North where I thought everyone was free. <laughs> so that on the night of my father's death, now my father had convinced my mother during my senior year of high school to try one more time for this boy. 
So my mother kept getting sick. I didn't know what was wrong with her. And one day at school, my best friend asked, she said, how is your mom? I said, she doesn't seem to be getting any better. She said, girl, your daddy was at the store yesterday giving out cigars. Your, dad, your mama's going to have a baby. <laughs> he told everyone that this one was the son and in fact was having a new home built and a room just for him. Uh, he didn't live to see my, my brother's birth. My brother was born on the day I graduated from high school. But on the night of my father's death, I felt I needed to do something. As the oldest, I felt I had to do something in answer to what had happened. So many people had been killed in Baker County. And here my father was, a leader in, in the community, another one. And I just felt I had to do something. And on the night of his death, as our house filled with people, I was praying and asking God to help me figure out just what to do. And I, my thoughts ran all over the place, the thought of trying to get a gun to go and find this man to kill him. Well, I knew I couldn't do that. I, um, my father had tried to train us to fire a weapon one day. And all of my, my four sisters, from the youngest on up, was just taking their turn at it. And all I could do was cry. I couldn't, I couldn't even fire a weapon. But that night, as I prayed and asked, asked God to help me figure out what I could do, it just suddenly dawned on me, you can not leave the South, which is what I wanted to do. You can stay here and devote your life to working for change. And that's what I did. I didn't know how I was 17 years old, senior in high school. Once my father was dead, I didn't even know that I could go to college. But cer cer certainly the thought of going to the north to school was definitely nothing I could do. And, um, it was even, you know, during that summer before I knew I could actually go to college, but chose not to go far away, but to, to stay in the area and begin the work. I started the work that summer with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and I can tell you that the Gator didn't know what had hit him. <laughs> we ended up getting an injunction against him that summer, I remember we, we, we had all these mass meetings, and you all, when you say we the people, you know, that's what the movement was. It was we the people. We came together, and we, we, we got strength from each other. And even though we didn't have all of the answers, we knew we could move forward together and make change. So people came off plantations, and that wasn't an easy thing to do because they lived on someone else's land, but they came together. And we had our bloody Saturday in Baker County. And then we, we had to get to Washington. One night we had a mass meeting and five carloads of us had to, to go north to get to Washington, but we knew the Gator was up Highway 91 waiting on us. So we went east into another county. And then when he knew anything, he was reading about the, the testimony and the marching and so forth that we did at the Justice Department to try to deal with the issues in Baker County. And I was reading an article about our efforts there, and it was your Congressman Conyers who said, we need to get protection for these people when they go back to Baker County. He was very supportive of what we were doing. We the people, we were poor, uneducated, isolated, mostly farmers, but when we stood up in mass meetings talking about our problems, it was always the problems we had, what the sheriff was doing to us, 
What must our first, second, third, and third steps be to secure our right to vote? We accepted that we didn't have equal access to opportunities to realize the American dream. But we were willing, we the people, were willing to fight so that we, the people, could have those rights. Despite the accomplishments of the Civil Rights Movement, we have a long way to go. You know, on any given night, there are millions of people in this country who are homeless and who are hungry. And when you look at the educational statistics for poor uh, minorities, the picture just does not look good. We, the people, those of us who have better opportunities, you know, back during the Civil Rights Movement, all black people were in the same boat. That's the way I refer to it as that, teachers, doctors, lawyers, we all face the discrimination and we could work together. It's different now. Some of us have had better opportunities we had, and, and therefore we can live a better life. But we have to always think about those who do not have and do whatever we can where we are to make life better for all of us. We the people. You know, and I need to say to the young people, and my understanding is that there are some high school students as well, you can make the decision to make a difference even at a young age. And when you do the right thing, when you do what God would expect of you, good comes back to you. You know, you set out trying to help yourself, but when you look back, who got helped? You did. And that's what you have to realize, and that is not a selfish thing. You know, I think about how I made the decision at the age of 17 to work. I thought I was giving up a better life for me. Now, I can't tell you it's been a bed of roses. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I've been in some very, 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 very difficult and dangerous situations through the years. You would have to know that because of the work that I chose to do. I chose to do the work, and I knew it wouldn't be easy. But you know, God is so good. He is so good. He is. You know, God is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? That's why, as things unfolded last summer, you know, I look back and I know that everything that happened to me through the years, God prepared me for that moment. People ask, how could you be so calm? When you're coming from truth, when you're coming from right, you don't have to worry. <laughs> you know, I've told the story of my transformation for many, many years. Many who initially heard what happened last summer thought that I did that as a government worker. You know, <laughs> I didn't get to work a whole year for the government. <laughs> Many in the farm movement didn't want to see me go and work for the government when I chose to do that. But I look at it, you know, people talk about the Civil Rights Movement as if the Civil Rights Movement was a movement of, of the 60s. It started, we accomplished a few things, and it ended. I've been working in the movement since 1965. <laughs> and
And when I made the decision back in 1965 to stay and work for change, yes, my initial decision was really thinking about black people. And that's why when Roger Spooner came to me, you know, I know it was difficult for him to come. He was coming, here's a white man of the South, coming to ask a black woman for help. Now he came to me because he had heard of my reputation from black farmers for being able to help deal with people at the Department of Agriculture. I was getting results. So he came, and I'm sure it was a difficult thing for him, and that came across to me, because you know I gave you some of my background to help you understand where I was coming from, and I'm sitting there hearing a white man ask me for help, a white man who I thought had all of the advantages. You know, he had heard about what I was doing for black farmers, so he, you know, he wanted to come and get even more advantages that I could offer. That was where I was at that time. But as I've told the story for so many years, working with Roger Spooner helped me to see that the issue is not totally about race. And that's why I use my life. Now people ask me, will you, after what happened to you, will you tell it the same way again? Yes, I will. I will not change how I tell the story because I use my life and my story to try to help people get beyond the issue of race. We should be beyond that now. We should be able to move together Black, white, Hispanic, Native American, Asian American, Alaskan, all of us working together to try to make where we live better places. Now what you don't know about what happened last year is that I learned about the existence of that tape five days before you heard about it in the news. I was sitting in a meeting as State Director of Rural Development in Georgia um, of 1890 land-grant institutions, black land-grant institutions, and just happened to check my email. And someone had sent me this message saying, you should be ashamed of yourself. Uh, refusing to help a white farmer and said some other stuff. Well, I sat there in the meeting and responded to that individual. You know, you don't know who's, who's um, communicating with you. But I sent a message back saying, that's not my message. I said what my message was. And then um, this, I sent that to the individual. Whoever it was sent a message back to me saying, it looks like someone misrepresented your words. How can I get a copy of the whole tape? And I told that individual how I thought they could get a copy of the whole tape. Then I sat there and sent all of that correspondence to the Department of Agriculture. I was the one who notified them about the existence of the tape. And I told them, again, what my message was and asked for help to deal with it. They chose to do nothing. Nothing. That was a Thursday. So by Monday, all of the, the right wing and others were calling for my head. You know, I'm way over in, in um, West Point, Georgia, with my leadership staff at Rural Development. And we were there because that is where the Kia plant has located. And Rural Development did lots to help, lots of work to help uh, the city of West Point get additional sewer capacity and other things that they needed to be ready for Kia. And the city manager and mayor wanted to thank us, so we had our meeting there. So I'm way over there. Um, couldn't go on the tour of Kia, because I'm now trying to deal with the fact that if that Blackberry could have jumped up off the floor, off the table, it would have. The calls were coming in on it. 
they were an email, they were going into my office in Athens and into Washington. So that once my staff came back from the tour of Kia, I told them to sit down, let me explain to you what's happening. Now in Georgia, I inherited a staff of 129. Less than 20 of them are black. Many of them are people I had to nudge, or I can't think of a better word to say, to make them do the right thing through the years. And now I was their boss. But by this time, we had been working together for nearly 11 months. And they had gotten to know me, and we had become a real team. Um, I eventually had to tell, I told them what was happening. I received a call at that point from Cheryl Cook, and I was initially placed on administrative leave. I told the staff that. They were asking, what can we do? I said, I don't know. But they asked, can we pray? So we got in a circle and prayed. And then you read about or heard about what happened after that on my long drive back to Athens, eventually being asked to pull to the side of the road to submit my letter of resignation by Blackberry. It just didn't seem real. It didn't seem real that someone could take something you're trying to tell for good and turn it around to make it totally the opposite of what your message is. But when you hear me say God is good, he is definitely good, and I know he prepared me for what I had to go through. When I got to rural development, I told the staff that if I don't accomplish but these two things, I want to accomplish them while I'm here. And that is I want people to know the programs of this agency and know that they have equal access. And then I, I decided to target the poorest counties in the state. And I used $20,000 median household income as, I, as my cutoff. And I want you to know there were nine counties in the state. One of them had a median household income of just slightly over 17,000. Not only did I, I, I push the rural development staff to really reach out and do more in these counties, but I pulled together other USDA agencies and state agencies and said, these, we all have a mission to do work in these counties. Why can't we work together to try to make some real change? And that's the work I was doing in Georgia. What, you know, when I asked the staff at Rural Development, tell me what our activities are in these nine counties, it took them over a month to pull that information together. And I think they were shocked, because there were many zeros across the page under the programs that we had to offer. When the secretary offered that job to me, he called me one day and I said, um, Mr. Secretary, um, tell me what kind of budget does that office have? He said, 35 million. I said, really? Now what he didn't understand, while, before I came to rural development, I worked on every farm bill for years from the nonprofit level. So I knew what was in the farm bill, and I knew that that office didn't have a $35 million budget. So <laughs> when I said, really, he said, well, that's 2501 small farm producers. He started naming all the program, 26 staff. And my question to him was, what money is there to do any work? But I told him while I had him on the phone, I said, you know, you didn't ask me what I was doing in Georgia. I said, I sent reports up there, but you didn't ask me. But let me tell you what I was doing. So I told him about what I was doing with those nine 
poorest counties in the state, and I told him how I pulled others in to help work on the initiative. Now, he, he didn't tell me he was taking notes, but when I went up a, a month later to tell him that I was not going to take the position he was offering me, he brought it up again. We talked a little. You know, as he tried to convince me to take that job, saying, you're the only person in this country who's really qualified to do this work. But I knew that I would have been stuck back there in an office somewhere with nothing to do any work, and you wouldn't have heard anything else from me. They would have put a cap on my mouth, and uh, that would have been the end of Shirley Sherrod and the work she was trying to do. But uh, a couple of weeks after that, I learned that he was putting together a whole initiative at USDA that he called Strike Force, and he was using the model that I developed in Georgia to do that. What they found after I left, you know how they started looking at your work really close then. Well, they found. <laughs> They found that I had gotten three times more money into persistently poor counties in Georgia in the 11 months I was there than they, than they did all of the previous eight years. <laughs> and you know what? Georgia came in second only to the state of California California and business and industry loan guarantees last year. We were doing the work we were supposed to be doing. They found that out after I left. <laughs> and while I was there to tell the secretary I couldn't take that job, I said, you know, uh, Mr. Secretary, people all over this country want to know why I didn't do anything wrong, so why didn't you offer me my old job back? He said, well, you can have it, but is that offering you your job? I don't think so. So, you know, to say it that way, too, was not, I didn't do anything wrong. Why couldn't I go back and continue the work I was doing at Rural Development in Georgia? I still would like it, the real answer for that. You know, but the, the main, my main point back then to the NAACP and today is that we have to learn to work together. We, the people, can make the changes we need to make in this country. We can't look for the government to legislate that to us. They can't tell us how to get along with each other. Yeah, they can make laws, but they don't work. We can make that happen. We the people. <laughs> Dr. King once said, one of the great tragedies of man's long trek along the highway of history has been the limiting of neighborly concerns due to tribe, race, class, or nation. He said the devastating consequences of this narrow, group-centered attitude is that one does not really mind what happens to people outside of their own group. That's where I was when I met the Spooners. But I'm so thankful to God that I am no longer carrying that burden as part of my life. God has helped me to see and I will spend the rest of my life trying to help others to see that we don't need to, we need to help others to get rid of the fear and the burden of hate. You know, we need to release it so that we can look at each other as sisters and brothers and do the right thing by each other. And I really want to stress to young people when you do the right thing, when you do the right thing, you know, sometimes you can look at what happened to me back in July. It was terrible as I was going through it, but look at how God just turned it around. You know, 
I mean, it was almost overnight as the truth started coming out. I guess if it hadn't happened, no one would ever have heard about the work that was being done. But I wasn't looking for any, I wasn't looking for anyone to praise me over the work or to validate me because of the work. I just wanted to do my part while I was here to make life better where I was. And that's what we all need to do. That's what we all can do here in this country. We thought we had completed the work when we fought in the civil rights movement of the 60s. We thought the job was done when we had the right to vote, when we integrated the schools and gained the right to eat, sleep, and live anywhere. Yes, we thought we had solved all of our problems. We didn't ever really deal with the issues of racism. And we thought when we had elected a black president, it was all over. But oh, didn't my situation show. <laughs> it's more critical now for us to work together with 24-hour television, talk shows, some of them designed to promote hate, radio shows, you know, we've got to figure out how to put that where it ought to be and go on to do the right thing by each other. Our children need us. Our communities need us. And believe it or not, our government need us. The fight is more difficult, but we have to do the difficult work this day, these days. We, the people, need to work together as brothers and sisters across racial lines to make our communities and our country a better place for our children, grandchildren, and many generations to come. You know, we the people, after all, you know, yes, we may be white, black, the different cultures, but when you pull the covers off. We are all just human beings, human beings who have the capacity to love, the capacity to work together, the, com the capacity to make where we live the best place in the world to be. So thank you. Uh, before we go to question and answer, just let me make a brief statement. Um, it's often been said that we all in life have a story to tell. And most, the most important thing is to tell the story. And so we're so delightful that you've been able to tell your story. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's also very important that we listen to the story as well and that we learn. When the students um, first pushed for the commemoration of Dr. King 25 years ago, uh, they didn't want class to suspend it. People are always asking, why doesn't Michigan close on Martin Luther King Day? Martin Luther King Day. The students wanted a teach-in. They wanted to learn about civil rights, about equality, about opportunity, and social justice. And so it is important that we recognize that this is a learning experience for all of us. There are a lot of activities, and we hope that it's impossible to see everyone, but we hope that you can go to as many 
as possible. The lessons learned today to me, uh, number one, when you, when you look at a 43-year period time uh, before the death of Dr. King, uh, people may push for a legacy of daring to dream, a legacy of hope. Uh, and they believe that. They look to the future. They also push for uh, a legacy of long-term commitment. These changes do not come overnight. As I mentioned this morning, it took 20 years just to get the legislation uh, passed and to have a King holiday. And by the time the U.S. government and the U.S. Congress had passed the legislation, most of the states were already celebrating uh, Dr. King's holiday. Um, and then a final comment before we open up to a question and answer is that we also have to remember that from this was a legacy of sacrifice and a legacy of uh, risk taking, as those mentioned. Folks gave their lives in order for all of us to be sitting here listening to this today. Uh, people get not only gave their personal, their lives personally, but they even put their children out there. If you go back and look at some of the footage the mid-1960, people put their uh, children out there, and those children had fire hoses put on them. They also had uh, uh, those German shepherds on them, too. And so we have to always remember that things don't come easy. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight and that one has to make uh, sacrifices. So again, we are so happy that you come uh, to remind us to make the connection because there's always a connection and that you have come to remind us that it's a never ending story. Much has been accomplished, much more needs to be accomplished. Thank you. Um, we have microphones. Uh, Mrs. Sherrod has gracefully uh, uh, um, decided that she wants to engage. She's going to be here for the entire day, so a little bit later she'll have lunch with uh, students. But if you have questions, please uh, go to the center and someone will give you a microphone. Um, thanks, Ms. Sherrod, for your story. It was quite inspiring. Um, you were in the SNCC uh, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and we know a lot of folks that were in SNCC came from the North, and you know they did risk their lives, but they did go back. But you were living in the South the entire time. Can you tell us a little bit how it was to be in SNCC and to be living in the South uh, at the same time? Well, you know, um, as you said, so many came and left, uh, one of the things that, that, that happened with me is that I married someone who was also the first field secretary for SNCC, and both of us have stayed in the South and worked. So he's, he's probably the only person in SNCC who went to an area to work and didn't leave, still there working. But, you know, you were always, um, threatened um, living where we lived. Um, to take on the gator, um, I tell you, it, you, we knew we couldn't ride, uh, let, let me just uh, give you an account of something that happened one night. Um, uh, I had been into Atlanta in, in a pilot upward bound program and, and, and the movement had started in Baker County and I'm trying to get back there. And so when I came home, uh, my sisters and about 20 others were, or maybe more than that, were in jail and they were having a hearing that night uh, at the courthouse to decide whether some of them would be released. And um, when the judge got up to walk out of the room, Room. Of course, we were getting up to leave, and the gator went and kicked the door closed and said, sit your, you, well, I'll just, your goddamn asses down. And then he cursed us and did every, said everything he wanted to say um, until he was tired, and then he opened the door and told us to get out. Now, we knew we couldn't ride, you know, we couldn't just leave in a car and go home. 
we had to ride in groups at night. And about four miles out of the city, here's his son out there, he was his deputy then, uh, with a flashlight stopping us, shining the lights all in the cars and saying, uh, you didn't stop at the stop sign back in town, four miles back. Harassment, we were harassed, and, and, um, but we were committed. Um, to live in the South and be able to fight the injustices was, it gave us something to do. It gave us even more of a reason to live and be committed to the work. Yes, we were afraid, but we were afraid together, we the people. <laughs> Good morning, Ms. Gerard. My name is Rick Gonzalez from WCC. You stated earlier in your question, I mean, in your um, speech there, that uh, once we all remove our covers, that we are all human beings. We must pull together in this country in order to benefit and make a better place for our children and our future children. But what would you have to say about this country with those that are reluctant to make a change? What are your beliefs in that? We have to love them too, and keep working on them. And I think the examples we set can bring others to this movement. And I, you know, you heard me say that people think of the movement as, as having happened for a certain period of time, but you know, we just we can't we can't let what others can't accept stop us from doing what we need to do. And if enough of us will do that in our communities, we will eventually bring some of them around. Good morning, Mrs. Sherrod. Uh, thank you so much for what you've done and for what you're doing for us, the people. Uh, there's a phrase that uh, in parts of Africa is called Ubuntu, meaning that I am because you are. <laughs> and I thank you today because we are because you are. And I want to say also in the book of Micah, it tells us that God requires. He says, what does God require of us? God requires justice. And I want to ask the question today, do you see us ever being at a point where we are truly a country of justice and not fear and hate. I could, that's, it's, it's possible to do that. And that's why as I go around the country, I keep saying to us, it starts with all of us. If enough of us are working on a local level to make it happen where we are. That spreads all over. We have to be committed to trying to make this country a better place and not just live. You can see if you go try to live over there in a little area away from everyone else, it eventually gets to you. We have to make it better where we are to try to keep it so that we, we bring others in and we, we help others to see that the movement, we don't need Congress to tell us what we need to do to live together. We don't need the president to tell us. We know what it takes where we are. And if we make it better where we are, we can stop living in fear where we are. Hello, my name is Mr. Demetrius Russell, Urban Preps graduate, Urban Prep East Garfield Parks graduate in class of 2013, proud of integrity. And my question is, in your opinion, what as we as people, what should we do in order to form a more perfect union? See, it's just what, I'm, what I've been saying. Work on your local level. He, you, you here in this university, do what you have to do here. In your communities, do what you have to do here, there. And we can't be satisfied if I, I just can't say enough that, you know, years ago, 
when, especially among black people, you know how they used to send someone off to school and they were expected to come back and help others? We have to do that as people now. You don't know who you might be helping. You know, you don't know who you might be saving, you know, to reach back and help others. But we have to do, see, everybody can't move forward to be a big leader in this country, but you can do that in your communities. You can do that in your church. You can do that in your school. You can do your part. And if we have that kind of movement going on all across this country, I guarantee you change will happen. Hi, good morning. Um, have you ever received a formal apology from the Obama administration? <laughs> I received a call from the president um, that the Thursday of the week all of that was unfolding. And I, even though we were not in each other's presence, I could feel it was a call he felt he had to make, but was very uncomfortable with it, and he just kept t trying to tell me that, uh, you know, I'm aware of the issues you've been putting out there this week, and if you read my book, you'll understand that I, I know them. And I, I said to him, you know, you don't understand these issues like I do. So we went back and forth like that, and uh, I wasn't given, and he wasn't either. So, <laughs> so, um, I finally said to him, you know, I need to get you to Southwest Georgia. And he said, well, Sanford, Sanford Bishop is the congressman from that, from that area. He said, Sanford has been trying to get me down there. I said, well, you need to come. And when you come, bring Michelle with you, because there are some things I need to show you. And I need to help you with your understanding. So we sort of left it like that. <laughs> Hello, I'm Mr. Lawrence Mead, class 2013, Urban Prep, East Garfield Park. And I understand that you are a um, true trailblazer and many of your actions that you have took um, made things, I mean, better for us. But I must say, um, is there any time where you regret a choice that you have made um, from the past that you wish you could have changed? Now, if you had asked me during some of those years when times were so hard, when I didn't have enough money sometimes to barely make it, my husband and I both were committed to the movement. When my children were in college and it was so difficult for me, um, I probably, probably would have said at some point during that time, you know, maybe I should have taken the tradi traditional route and done what I could have done for myself. But looking back, I know I would not have been satisfied. And that the, the work that I did was the most satisfying work for me. Yes, it was hard. Yes, I had hard times uh, at times. Because we both, my, my husband, um, has, uh, he has two masters, you know, one from Virginia Union Theological Seminary and one from Union Theological Seminary in New York. And we could have had a good living had we just concentrated on ourselves. But I don't think either of us regret, regret what we've done to help others. And yes, I would do it all over again because when you help others, you know, yes, you can be satisfied to get a good paycheck, but when you help others, you truly feel the joy from within. I'm here to say that uh, I'm extremely, extremely touched and moved by your deep, deep compassion for the history uh, of, of pain, uh, recent and past, that you got through. When you talk about a movement among the farmers, uh, I'm impressed that you moved it away from, you know, black versus white to the pain among all farmers. Today we have a lot of economic pain among black, white, you know, different religions and races. Um, and I'd like to hear 
your wisdom on how what you did with farmers can be translated into us as a nation to heal the economic and social pain together versus this group versus that group and to be effective with it because you do have a very effective, sensible type of compassion that would help us to achieve that goal. You know, it all comes from a, a desire to really help and to do the best that you can do. I, it wasn't that I and some others of us had a blueprint for what we could do with farmers and for farmers, you know, organizing the cooperatives and, and getting them and keeping them motivated to trying to hold. I don't know whether you all realize how much land has been lost by black farmers, but around 1920, there was over 15 million acres of land, and today there are less than two million acres, and we're still losing land and still losing farmers. And uh, just the just, uh, desire to work with them, to help move them, yes, to get a lawsuit against USDA. You know, everybody think that was done by John Boyd and John Boyd only, but I can tell you, John Boyd wasn't even in the movement to get, to work on a lawsuit when we first started doing that. But let that be where it is. When you truly have a desire to help others, you'll seek the information you need to get. You'll do what you need to do. You'll push farmers, yes, to organize cooperatives, to work together, because that's the only way they're going to make it. Um, it's... You know, I don't know, I, I, I didn't want to have anything to do with agriculture, didn't even study it in school, but uh, you, you do what you have to do uh, when you're committed to helping others. So you learn what you have to learn. And yes, you, you work in the fields when you don't feel you want to do that uh, as well, even as an adult. I'm not sure I answered you. It's just, it's hard to come up with an answer for that. You just have to do what you got to do when you're committed. Hello, uh, my name is Ed. Uh, Currently, uh, we're experiencing, uh, uh, we appear to be experiencing uh, uh, some of the same uh, bigotry and hardships toward Middle Eastern people, Arabs and Muslims, that blacks experienced and have been experiencing. And I ask you uh, what, if you have any thoughts on that situation and what we might do to improve it. Well, that's why when I move around the country now, when I talk about racism, I'm not just talking about black and white. You know, we, we have to learn the cultures of others. And when we do that, then the fear leaves us. We're not afraid. A lot of what people do out of hate is due to fear. Some of it, now some of them have other agendas. I'm not going to give them the credit of, of thinking that they are so naive. Some of them have an agenda to try to promote hate. but. Those of us in our communities, when we really get to know each other, we find that we can be friends and we can make a difference together where we are. That's what happened to me with the Spooners. We became really, really good friends. And that's why when that stuff hit the news, I thought CNN had found the Spooners. The Spooners found CNN to tell them the truth. <laughs> you know, so the, the whole point is, is um, the local conversations, the one-on-ones that need to happen that spread into larger conversations. Um, to become comfortable. Uh, we allow the, the discomfort we feel to keep us separated, and somehow we have to figure out how to do that. We didn't quite get it right with black and white. We have more chances now with different mixes to try to get it right in this country. We are here. Nobody's leaving. You know, <laughs> we got to figure it out. Um, my question is a little bit personal about religion. 
Uh, I, I heard you mention a lot praying and how God has helped you throughout this, uh, your, your journey and your activism. And for me, I, I do not believe in God. I'm like a atheist agnostic. And I just kind of wonder how your journey would have been different if, and how, how God, maybe talking more about how God has helped you. And um, I, I just, I, I really value how I, some people I know, including, I mean, I don't know you that well, but some people I know are very, God has helped them to be very committed and has helped them through difficult times. So I, I just want to, if you can kind of expand on that, I'd appreciate it. You know, if not God, I feel you got to believe in something. Um, in my case, it's God. You know, I feel that he's protected me throughout my life, but you got to reach out to something, I feel, to help you um, to do and to be what you need to be in this world. Um, I guess that's the most I can say about that. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Mr. Stewart. I'm from Urban Prep, Charlie Academy for Young Men, East Garfield Park Campus in Chicago. And I want to know, how did you deal with the everyday life struggle with segregation and how people, like people always being killed, you know, beat down and stuff, how did you deal with that? It was difficult during my years of growing up. That's why I had this dream of, of leaving the South um, to go to where I thought life was better. But once the commitment was made to stay, then you've got to, you know, yes, there are things that happen. You know it was racism. And when you can, you call it out for what it, it was and what it is. And when you can't, you don't let that stop you from doing what you know you have to do. You have to work, you have to realize that that person doing whatever it is they're doing um, has a problem, you know? And whatever you can do to help them see that. You know, I was, um, I think I told somebody here recently, I went with a farmer to a farmer's home administration. This was back maybe 1985. That, that man was uh, threatening, the county supervisor was gonna foreclose on this farmer and his wife, and they asked me to go with them to the office, I did. And uh, as this man who was coming from a position of authority was telling them how he was gonna take take their land and, um, and their home, the wife started crying. And um, clearly, because regulations had changed. See, this is, this is another thing you have to do. What I realized early on was, even though I wasn't a, a, a government employee, I had to get those regulations, and I had to learn those regulations better than the employees they had down in those local offices. And I had to, <laughs> see, I had to make sure everyone who worked with me, I trained them too, so that they knew. So I knew that this man was sitting up there, and he wasn't telling them the regulations as they were at the time. And I, I tried to be nice. I let him talk, he wouldn't stop. So I finally said to him, I just broke in and said, um, will you put that in writing? And he sat there, and this is no lie. He pushed his chair back from the desk and started looking at his feet. He eventually turned the chair all the way around looking at the floor, and then looked at me and said, I ain't putting nothing in writing. We went at each other. I can't tell you what I said, but I don't know what finally stopped us. We finally stopped. But you know what happened to him? And so I started submitting complaints against him. I started pointing out all the things that were wrong going on in that office. In that office. He eventually left the agency. You know, but so my point is, do all you can do. Don't let what they are doing to you stop you from being what you can be. Okay. Thank you all for your questions. This will be our last question of the morning. Okay. Hello there. 
My name is Noah Gillespie. Thank you for coming, Ms. Sherrod. Your words have been inspiring, truly. I have but one question to ask you. I think my generation needs some words of wisdom from you. If you could say something, anything, to people of my age and my generation and for future generations, what would it be? I would say to you, don't just think of yourself. Now, you've got to make yourself the best you can be. But don't just make yourself the best you can be for you. Think of it as being for you, your family, your community. And then do all that you can do. You can make a commitment to do good and do right. And you'll look back and where you thought you were being unselfish and helping others, you really helped yourself. So my, my, my thing to you would be, learn all that you can learn. Be all that you can be, but don't do it just for yourself. Uh, excuse me. You, you saw me inching closer and closer, so you knew this, this was coming. Uh, so I hate to be the merchant of doom, but uh, it seems like when you have a combination of a question asking audience and a question answering speaker, uh, it's an interesting combination. But we do have uh, commitments to some of our units to end at a certain time so that they can start there. So again, we express our appreciation for Mrs. Sherrod taking time out to visit us. Um, and also, give yourself a hand, too. There are a lot of folks who are at home or shopping. And so we're really pleased that you could take time out from your schedule to be with us. Thank you.